Okay, go ahead. All right, so it's unrelated to Calvinism, but it's related to the predestination. Mm -hmm. So I assume you're a dispensational premillennialist. Hold on, let me turn the volume up here. Yeah. Let me speak up. Um, <clears throat> I, I'll go along with the the premillennial label, um, but I stay as far away as I can from certain labels that carry some baggage with it because when you ask somebody if they're a dispensationalist um that can mean a number of things such as you know different means of you know salvation during different I'm ages curious. of you know grace yeah. and law and that kind of thing my biggest thing with the the dispensationalism is <laughs> um so when it comes to like dispensational label or whatever my the big thing is yes i make a dis strong distinction between the church and israel yeah so my question then would be um so obviously the what ephesians 1 refers to in the predestination on the adoption, um, that's the redemption, the rapture, when our bodies are redeemed, because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. So my question then is, being that the rapture is pre-tribulation, when that happens, there's no like secondary redemption. So does that mean that there is no salvation after we, the dead in Christ rise along with the Holy Spirit for that seven-year time period? Well, see, now we're getting into eschatology, and I, I don't want to get sidetracked here because I'm trying to keep the theme of Calvinism going. But, um, you know, you've got, in a way, a lot of people put it like, I like how guys like John MacArthur put it that you know, he, he considers like the first resurrection beginning with Christ, and then then the first re resurrection continues on with oh, the church being taken up out of here. Um, and then obviously the the uh you know the, the 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 general resurrection so to speak at the at the end of the the tribulation period uh, i don't know like specifically just real quick and then we got to get on to what we're on here but um like the basis of your question for determining premillennialism is that what it's based on or like are you post well, no, no, I'm pre mill. I, I was just wondering if I believe the preacher rapture, and that's the redemption. That's when the dead in Christ rise first, along with the believers. So that's when our, our bodies are redeemed. So being that there is no second resurrection, and that after that tribulation, Jesus comes back, kills everyone out the sword out of his mouth. It, does that mean no one can be saved during that seven year period because the, the redemption has already happened? Okay, so what you're dealing with is yeah, the church is out of here. <clears throat> when the redemption takes place and we receive our glorified bodies we go up during that seven years for the marriage supper of the lamb and all the judgment seat of christ for rewards or lack thereof at the end of the seven years <clears throat> and you know it you can't really fully be dogmatic when it says that christ is gonna you know a lot of people they just say well we're gonna come back with jesus and then we're gonna win the battle of Armageddon, rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Well, the only people that are distinctly spoken of <clears throat> to enter into that millennial kingdom and rule and reign are, <clears throat> are those who survive the tribulation period along with all of the martyrs that are resurrected at the end of the seven years. So you've got that, that is, that's the resurrection that takes place at the end of the tribulation period are those that have been martyred and all that have been martyred um will go into the millennial kingdom as well that makes, that makes sense <laughs> uh, thank, thank you Jared, for that yeah. so i didn't see a lot of the back and forth going on other than some of the 
people just razzing each other about stuff. Um, and I, I, and I don't want this to be, I want this to, to be, have some collaboration to it, but I don't want it to turn into drilling down on one verse after the next. You know what I mean? I want to, I want this to kind of be a discussion that sort of looks at things more or less from, to try to help you guys understand really what the, what the root of the issue is that goes along with much of what would be considered reform theology, um, you know, and <clears throat> we, we don't have time to obviously go back and go through the entire, you know, history of it. I kind of touched on it in the, on the TikTok live as far as, um, you know, the fact that, that it really got its traction going you know, people pick and choose. Constantine said this and all. It, it really, the whole, everything that led up to what we consider modern day, you know, Calvinistic doctrine started really with between Augustine and Pelagius. And it just sort of flourished from there. And over time, things changed. And the way that they, you know, defined certain belief systems, and some were for this, some were for that. And you know, it wasn't until what, around 1200s, around the 13th century, that, that the idea of limited atonement was even presented, um, you know, and it just sort of developed. And of course, with the late coming ad edition of the limited atonement, it's also, and, you know, Caleb, I'm sure can, you know, um, attest to the fact that there's a lot of what you consider four point Calvinists out there that, you know, that's, that's, a big hangout for a lot of them and it should be um the the whole teaching of limited atonement in, in and of itself um <clears throat> but the five-point calvinists will say there's no such thing as a four-point <laughs> um because it's again it's part of this system that's put together in pieces um that's been developed over time that it all has to sync up not only with the doctrines and teachings of it but it has to sync up with the proof text used in scripture to be able you know to support it the the the, the problem with you know um i'm trying to think of a of a good overarching approach to you know like i use the idea of of it being more or less a false paradigm that bible believers are not subject to in the sense that you know this little spat between calvinists and arminius arminians that um that's between them and they try to drag you know the folks that are not part of that into the middle of it and then what they'll do is they will they will put labels on you they will um they will try to convince you that you believe something that you don't or that you believe a position like for example if you talk to a calvinist they are going to be pretty well versed in in um their apologetics towards arminianism <laughs> um they've got their proof text they've got you know all of the quotes by the church forefathers and the confessions of faith and all that stuff when a person comes in and doesn't play by the rules and uses scripture as the starting point for every discussion then in a lot of ways it, it causes calvinists to short circuit because you know what they are accustomed to is like i said earlier the the you know, if you're not, if you don't believe in unconditional election, then you believe in conditional election and they start going down that road. Well, then when they come across somebody that understands that scripture doesn't teach anything, any, any relation between election and salvation, conversion, regeneration, that's what I mean by salvation there. Um, well, then it, they, they, it completely throws them off of and I'm not talking about the winning of a debate type. I'm talking about 
they have these these glasses that they put on like these rose color, colored lenses <clears throat> that that when they look at scripture they can no longer see scripture clearly for what the what the words on the page even say anymore and here's why is because if 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 they read a passage that clearly goes against any aspect of tulip or whatever they have to dismiss it um or they have to come up with it's there most most of the the proof text and responses to clear teaching it's always the response is always one or two layers below you know oh uh, well you know that's because the greek word for this means that oh uh, that's because it was mistranslated into this and that well that's because it, that's talking about the same you know group of people from all tongues and nations and da da da, da doesn't mean all you know a good example is john 6 44 which calvinists love <clears throat> and they talk about you know um that you know all, all that the father draws can come to me um and they'll say that that's all that's all without exception then they go to you know uh john 12 32 where it talks about jesus said and i will draw all men unto myself well now it's not it's no longer all without exception now it's all without distinction that that all doesn't really mean all and i'm not even getting into what draw actually entails and the fact that neither verse indicates the holy spirit drawing anybody in fact in john 6 you know you got the father drawing in john 6 talked about drawing in john 6 you've got the son spoken of to draw in verse 12 the drawing there and again this is and even if you go into the this all I'll say on that if you go into the greek that that word even in strong's concordance and all of them will say that, that there's two versions of draw that one of them is kicking and screaming dragging and that's not the word used in either passage it's the the attraction and draw it's the same word that am the word amber you know comes from and you can look at secular historians from centuries ago and it means just to attract you know to appeal to and draw it doesn't mean come kicking and screaming <clears throat> as the way a lot of people interpret it but when you look at you know the father drawing in chapter six the son drawing in chapter 12 one of them means all without distinction one means all without exception and then you start factoring in the fact that even in John six, which is not talking about, um, you know, and I've, I've talked a, a little bit about them. It's not talking, that is not a New Testament gospel presentation going on in John six. And the Holy Spirit in chapter seven, it's it, we're told by John in chapter, the chapter after chapter six, that the Holy Spirit is yet to come. And of course we know, um, you know, that it's not until the ascension of Christ that he even sends his Holy Spirit. So back to your point, Miles, on the, the dispensationalism and everything, you know, timeline wise, <clears throat> one of the problems that people run into, a lot of Calvinists are post mills. And the reason why is because when you, rightly divide the word as it relates to timeline as it relates to the church in israel it starts causing a lot of problems for the calvinists because post mill and all mill both they won't admit it teach replacement theology you know and i know caleb you know we, we had a couple comments about about that whole thing today and stuff and i know where you stand you are um but that's in a sense that's what it is that that the promises throughout all of scripture to Israel as a people, as a nation um, that God made because they rejected the Messiah, God changed his mind and stole all those promises and gave them to the church is basically what replacement theology more or less teaches that God's not keeping his word, which you might as well throw out the whole Bible at that point. And, you know, that's my 
stern take on it or whatever. I'm not accusing people of rejecting scripture, but in a sense, I mean, if you're going to say every single one of the covenants and promises made to Israel got ditched because that generation of Jewish leaders, not Jews entirely, but the Jewish leaders that prevented the kingdom from coming in, the Sanhedrins, the, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes were the ones that that Jesus called out and he said, you're not only preventing yourselves from going into the kingdom, but you're preventing the rest of these folks, all these other Jews, some that do believe from going into the kingdom. And that's, that's my position on it, which is the fact that had, had the Jewish religious leaders accepted Jesus as the Messiah, then the millennial kingdom would have, I believe would have just, picked up and went they would have gone right into the millennial kingdom at that moment but instead jesus told them that you're keeping them from going into the kingdom which is the kingdom of heaven the millennial kingdom it's not the same as the kingdom of god the kingdom of god's a spiritual kingdom but the kingdom of heaven which is only you that term's only used by matthew because that 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 account um you know of the gospel is a jewish centric take on it or whatever and the jews knew all about the millennial kingdom coming they were promised for generations um that kingdom of heaven got pushed out over two thousand years and counting now um well coming up on two thousand years and that god's blinded the hearts and the minds and the eyes of the jewish people doesn't mean that Jews don't get saved. I mean, there's a lot of Messianic Jews. There's a lot of just flat out, you know, born again Christian Jews that don't even consider themselves Messianic Jews that are getting saved, but they're very few and far between. But that veil, when the fullness of the Gentiles takes place in like Romans 11 talks about, that veil will be lifted when the church is brought up out of here. And the seven year tribulation period is for God to deal with Israel. And then that's when a lot of the rest of the full movement start taking place and all of Israel will be saved. There'll be a gospel angel flying around preaching the gospel and everybody will hear. That's why you get hear people, Christians say, Jesus can't come back until everybody hears the gospel. No, 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 no. That's, that's, that's not for today. It doesn't deal with us. That, that, that pertains to Daniel's 70th week at the end of the 70th week. But God handles things differently, and that's the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus, John the Baptist, and the, the 12 preached, which is a whole nother, I don't want to get going on that. They were not preaching Paul's gospel. Um, they were reaching to the Jews and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and that gets you into a lot of problems. <laughs> interpreting interpreting things well as long as well calvinism and so forth like you know we're talking about you know people say well you didn't choose god god chose you well okay let's start with scripture and they'll take you to john 15 16 and say so it says right here <laughs> read the chat what's that there's a, lot, there's a lot going on in the chat wait i have an objection oh i need to open up the chat so i can i can't even i didn't even realize are they going so to like talk? Yes, Wade, may we talk, please? Yes, 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 yes. Actually, go ahead and one at a time while I'm trying to pull this up here. I don't. Wade, I have a question. What is the redemptive historical purpose of the nation of Israel? Who was that? My name is Abraham Kuyper. Abraham Kuyper. Where are you from, Abraham Kuyper? Westminster Abbey. Noise. I'm sorry, I was just getting this chat pulled up. Hey, Aaron, if I missed any really good questions, let me know. Um, I'm sorry, can you ask your question again, please? My question was, what is the redemptive historical purpose of the nation of Israel? I'm curious. Well, see, and I, sh I, I probably shouldn't have even started going into into that whole thing because I'm, tr I'm trying to discuss discuss Calvinism and our um, 
why don't you, I notice your name um, as well. I'll tell you what, give me, give me a, give me a concise question that can get, they can have more of a concise response or DM me and we can talk about it like offline, if that makes sense. Like if there's something that I can satisfy now, I'll answer it, but that's a very open-ended question. You're on mute. Let's talk about Calvinism. Yeah. Yeah, that's that was what I want to focus on here. And I'm I, I, I'm not at all blowing you off and I apologize if it was. Um, I love talking about Israel, by the way, um, and the dispensations, but um, okay, so I'm going to scam through this. Does anybody have a question while I'm just backing up here? Because I didn't realize all this stuff was coming in here. Can you give me your biggest objection to total depravity? Well, again, see, and this is kind of what I was talking about um, earlier from the, the framing standpoint. You're asking me a question on my position on on a position that that I don't believe exists. Um, no, I'm asking your biggest objection to total depravity. I understand that but I don't get into topical discussions about Calvinism or anything else. Um, it, the starting point has to be scripture. So to take a concept that was put together through Gnosticism um, and, and then try to put a burden of pressure on me to start going through scripture to rebut a, a false teaching that I would object the doctrine please <laughs> quiet Aaron. um you know the the starting point has to be the word of God is what I is is what I'm saying here you're you if if, if you want to and I don't want to get sidetracked jumping from scripture to scripture to scripture discussing this sort of thing but um that's that's not not only that's not how i operate but none of us should operate that way you made a whole five-part series against it so i'm sure you do deal with topics hold on wait hold on wait, okay wait i have a question wait do you believe the bible has systematic topics what do you mean for example the doctrine of justification do hey, let, me, let me talk to that so here, here, here's the deal. Here, here's, here's the issue with systematic theology. When you have, <clears throat> rather than inductive method of interpretation, when you jump into, into systematic theology, let's, let's look at, let's just go ahead and take Calvinism as the example here. You have, you're dealing with a full-blown, fully operated, well-oiled machine system of theology that relates not only to salvation and soteriology, but it directly relates to our view or the view of those who adhere to it of God himself. So that's why Calvinism is not just a secondary issue. Okay. That system is when, when a person chooses, whether it's in their mind adopting and calling them, you know, and deciding that that's what they're going to believe is tulip <clears throat> and go that route. Um, or, you know, not really know what they're doing and maybe change their profile on social media to reform, whatever, or anywhere in between. When you make that decision, you have defected from your right to discern scripture on your own as it relates to those areas. You are wait. I, uh, wait. I, I completely agree with you. And I've watched 
your all of your videos on Calvinism and everything. Trust me, I went months back. Um, and there's a there's an important distinction that we have to make. It's not that we have created a system and try to fit the system into scripture. It's the other way around. We have read the scriptures and have built the system off what the scriptures teach. So, and, 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 I've, and I've seen you in your videos, you have stated things, and I'm just paraphrasing, that I'll save you the time to do the research and I'm just gonna tell you what they believe. And I think that much of the time you have misrepresented our views and I'd rather just go with what the scriptures teach by themselves. I know that we've got a few folks on here now and and this is a good opportunity. So one of the tenets of Calvinists is along with, along with completely defecting from the right to discern, because at that point you, you, you've given up on it. You can no longer view God the same way and soteriology the same way and all the doctrines that entail it by going to scripture at that point and allowing the Holy Spirit to guide you and teach you and learn new things from the living word of God. You, you have fully adopted a system that you have to either adhere to or get kicked out of the club. Wait, I have a question. So how did the Holy Spirit? Hold on. Hold on. Um, so part of that mindset that allow the type of person that would allow that to happen either has a either has a um a simplistic mind that has lacks cognitive skills and reason and logic or they don't understand scripture or don't know scripture or a combination of the two it it has to be one of those because when scripture is interpreted with the inductive method of actually figuring out what the Bible says and interpreting it as such and not trying to impose a system of prefabricated presuppositions and plugging it in where it suits their, their need, then the only option at that point is, is for them um, to to give up that okay what i'm saying is that that mindset and that type of a person that's that way cannot make a distinction between understanding and something and believing something and that's why the biggest defense that calvinists have against non-calvinists is that if you don't believe what calvinists teach it's because you don't understand it that's the that's the knee-jerk reaction from the mindset of a calvinist is that if you they don't, there's no distinction in their mind between not being able to understand something. It's just like the, it's, it's like, it's like sovereignty and omniscience that there's no, there's no distinction typically made. They're like, well, how can God not, how can God know everything, but not be sovereign and controlling everything? And it's like, that's cognitive distance. We could break down all the, the details of it, but those are not related. God's omniscience has nothing at all to do with his will and predetermined actions that he takes place, none. But it takes a person with a logical mind to sit down and think through it and understand that the light comes. So Calvinists through. don't have a logical mind. I'm saying that it's, 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 you're dealing with somebody that either does not have a logical mind and has the ability to reason which once they, if, even if they do and they buy into Calvinism because they don't know scripture and then they've given up their logic and their right, their sense making and their, their ability to reason. So I bring that up because Caleb, you mentioned something that I hear all the time that you want to explain to me where I misunderstand. And I've been accused plenty of times in the last couple of decades. You just don't understand it, but nobody's ever walked up to me and said, this is what you don't understand. <laughs> it's always a generalized broad. Can I do that right now? Yeah. Can I do that right now? We well, were predestined not to understand. <laughs> well, well you hey, said, I, I have an objection. So wait, if we're, if we're predestined, what's even the point of the gospel? Like I'm, I'm new to this stuff. I'm learning it. But like, if we're predestined, why would, what's even the point of the gospel? If like, 
we don't even have a chance if we're just predestined. Like, that's just, like, my logic on it. What? The Calvinist would say that that is the means God uses to save you, I, I believe. I don't, I'm not Calvinist, but. I feel yeah. like you've misinterpreted the nature of election. Um, God sending us to do, to preach the gospel should be enough reason. Exactly. There, exactly. there, there's no distinction made that people say, if, if God has, has chosen his elect, then why are we evangelizing when they will be saved anyway? And I feel like because Christ had told us to preach the gospel unto all the nations, that should be enough of an answer for people. And I believe people make the same criticism towards premillennialism anyway, because exactly. if in the end we all lose exactly. on earth, then what's the point? So there's I, more think than that, I think we have to establish well, that God a, has a, established has ordinary means of, means of grace. Um, we see this clearly in the book of Ezekiel with the, the dry bones. Uh, God told Ezekiel, go prophesy to those dry bones. Uh, so clearly God has established ordinary means of grace, Ezekiel being one of them. Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Uh, we are the means by which God uh, regenerates the elect. We are the ordinary means of grace. And when someone says that Calvinism destroys the evangelism, I don't understand because we Calvin was a great evangelist. He was he. He he encouraged evangelism greatly because he knew God had an elect out there. You just said that man is a, is a means to regenerating. Him. No, I said just man is the ordinary. We, we never, we never, we never attribute regeneration to the word of God or to the ordinary means, but we attribute regeneration to the working of the Holy Spirit through the through the preacher's preach word. You, I'm saying that Mr. Voss here just said that God uses us as a means to regeneration. No, no, I feel like you misinterpreted him. He is the ordinary means. The instrument ordinary. of is Amen. not the word of God, is not baptism, as the Roman Catholics say, but it's the working of the Holy Spirit. Through the preached word. As Paul says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Through the word of Christ. Amen, brother. So, Back to what I was talking about. I don't know if you guys were all on the, the live earlier. So, are you going to object, brother? Um, I'm sure you are. Um, we've, you know, when see, here's the, here's the issue is that there are so many misconceptions when it comes to, you know, the the the, the idea of the well, you know, even starting at the at the basis dealing with total depravity and so forth um, into getting a, a, an unregenerate person that just hates God and he's in a grave and he can't climb out and enmity mm -hmm. and all this other stuff and no man seeks God and all these other. Well, they were dead. Do you not believe that? Do you not believe? Hold on. That. Let him speak, that, Abraham. That that position, you know, gets established and then they'll, they'll and then the the, the the response is because there's nothing I don't care if God initiated it by creating the world and the universe and them and giving them the ability to hear and, and revealing his word and providing the gospel for them to be able to hear it and believe it and understand it the way scripture hits over and over and over throughout the New Testament throw all that out, that cannot happen the way that scripture says that it is and in the order that it's supposed to happen. We're going to go by quotes from, you know, the sprawls of the world or whatever that sat in a seminary and heard a professor, which is how Sproul learned it, that a, that a seminary professor got up. And are you going to attack Calvinist or are you going to attack our position, brother? He wrote regeneration precedes faith and it changed right. his ministry. Wait, it seems work. like you believed in an ordu saluti. Um, so there, you have to be able to reconcile. It. And then you start coming up with, well, how does a person go from being this wicked and lost and unresponsive to God, like as if they're walking around from the walking dead, to they, uh, being by generation, my friend? Please stop interrupting. Or I'm going to mute you. I'm trying to make a point here. 
to go from that state and that position to now suddenly becoming regenerated as part of this mysterious elect spoken of nowhere in scripture as it relates to salvation and then removing everything in between except for when it fits the narrative like what what you guys were talking about about well but yeah he does, he does need man to go out and preach the gospel and that's i mean that's why we do it they're going to get saved anyway but we do it just because we're told to to do it and everything and you know as if god this sovereign God that's spoken of by the Calvinist isn't capable of zapping as many people to get them saved without needing the help of some man going out and being an evangelist or a missionary or a preacher or sharing the gospel at a restaurant or, or whatever. But then they'll say, you know, there's a detachment there as far as doing that. But here's my question. If man from, from Adam all the way through to 2021 is born fully depraved and totally incapable of responding apart from being regenerated as the first step for salvation, then how on earth did any human being before Pentecost all the way back to Adam ever get saved? Because no, not a single man, woman, or child in the entire Old Testament and all the way through the Gospels was regenerated by the Holy Spirit at any point in time in their life. And you cannot prove from scripture otherwise, because that was a ministry to the church that when Jesus ascended, he said, I'm going to send a comforter. And the Holy Spirit came and baptized the disciples into the body of Christ. And they were regenerated and sealed into the day of redemption. That is a ministry of the Holy Spirit that began then and is still going on today and will continue to go on until the adoption, the redemption of their bodies that will predestine as believers unto to glorification. None of that applies to anybody in the Gospels. None of it applies to anybody in the Old Testament. So I want somebody to tell me how <clears throat> anybody in the Old Testament was even capable of any point in their life, not just being as dead throughout their life as the day that they fell into the grave and died without the regeneration of the Holy Spirit providing. You hear about the hall of faith, Wade, Abraham's faith, Wade, being accounted righteous. Where did his faith come from? If he was so Wade, wicked and depraved. Wade, do you, do you believe the Holy Spirit was not active in the Old Testament? Of course he was. How was the Holy Spirit inactive if Saul lost the Holy Spirit? He said he was active. He was. His ministry was different. He, the Spirit came upon people. The Spirit had he different roles. Yet the Spirit inspired the word of the, the brought the inspired word of God and revealed it. Okay. There was there were many there, just like today. There's many many ministries of the Holy Spirit. Of of course, I, I agree. In the Old Testament regeneration was not one of those ministries neither was so, the so wait were the authors of the old testament unregenerate is that is that what you're proposing right now say that again were the authors of the old testament was moses unregenerate yes that's exactly what i'm saying how does an unregenerate man write not, the we're not getting God? into philosophy here this is not philosophy wait how does an unregenerate man write the word of god in our view, it makes sense. God? <laughs> yeah, in our view, it makes sense. <laughs> How does that make sense? That's foolish. It doesn't make sense because you're looking at it through a Calvinist lens. Not necessarily. There's nothing why. in Scripture anywhere that mentions anything to do with with regeneration. With How baptism. can an unregenerate prophesy? How can I didn't say that the Holy Spirit didn't exist and don't not have I know ministries. you did not say that, Wade, but you said Moses was unregenerate. That's absurd. Right. The Holy Spirit did not have an, his ministry was not to indwell and regenerate and seal until Pentecost when the Holy Spirit that's fell. False. Back then he came that's and that's false. Do you believe that faith is something that is wrought by the Holy yeah. Spirit? Is faith no. wrought by the Holy Spirit? Where did no, faith I don't. That's the whole point of the whole way. Is Wade. that it's it is <laughs> you didn't like the Holy Spirit work different back then though? Like once Jesus died, he works in different ways. Yes. Like, Not necessarily. That's my point. 
where does faith come from? Is it an abstract thing that we can just use whenever we want? Or is faith wrought by the Holy Spirit, Wade? You just asked me that question and I told you that no Holy so Spirit, where the, where, we, where, the Holy Spirit is not, um, does, is not a, a minute, no, no ministry of the Holy Spirit involves him imparting saving faith to a lost person. So it's how do they believe, Wade? Wade, how do they believe? Because they have a choice. From the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. See, that's a problem. You have a problem with scriptural authority. Okay, hold on. Hold on. This is, let me tell you what the root of this issue is. The root of this issue is that Calvinists believe that man is totally enabled. The root is total depravity. If we can prove total depravity, all the other points fall into place. Caleb, that's really how this works. That, I, I don't so, know what you're saying. Wade believes that man is not totally enabled to receive the things of God to respond to the things well, wait let's 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 that's the root of this issue let's uh, be, because what they said is absurd this guy just said Moses was unregenerate where does faith come from Wade of course it comes by the word of God but where does it come from? Is this something because that... faith cometh because by Ephesians... hearing and hearing by the word of God? Yes, Ephesians yes, chapter wait. two. Ephesians chapter two, verse eight through nine. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. What is the antecedent of that? It is the grace and the faith. Faith That's is a gift. Salvation. Is... He's no, talking about grace faith. is the gift. Yo, wait, 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 it says, wait, 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 it says. A... We're not going to get into been... the, the just drill down. No, 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 I can no, no, trust, no, no, trust me. All throughout the the entire New Testament, the it is the grace of the gift of God. Grace is the gift, or whatever. Well, well let's look at the verse Ephesians two, verse Ephesians two eight through nine. It says, "For by grace you have been saved." This is a grammatical issue. Faith. Take offline, okay? It, it's this is not talk about it. Wait, We're dealing with wait, sentence wait. structure here. Wait, it's it's not a grammatical issue. Do you believe that in order to enter the kingdom of God, one must be born again or regenerated? Are you being disingenuous now or I'm I'm not being disingenuous because you just said Moses and the authors of the Old Testament were unregenerate. Can I respond to that? Can I respond to that? Go ahead, my good sir. So anybody that okay, so we trust in the cross, obviously we'll all agree with that. We trust in the gospel of death, burial, resurrection historically. It's a historic gospel. We look back to it. People in the Old Testament were believing in a prophetic gospel, meaning they believed it would happen in the future. So those people that did not see Christ until he until they died before Christ came, they were in Abraham's bosom. And then when Jesus was in the grave, he brought them the good news to where they could be saved. Because they had faith and God honored that. And God saved them until they could have their sins paid for to where they could believe. It's like so, so David, a man after God's own heart, was unregenerate. Yeah. Amazing. What? Amazing. Wait. Amazing. Boss, 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 boss. Are you, are you sure? You, you can flip out all you want, but you're not going to be able to find anything yes. in scripture that talks about regeneration taking place in the Old Testament. They, well, their faith was accounted righteousness unto him. And like Ethan was saying, that the result of those who put their faith in the Lord were taken to Abraham's bosom. And when Jesus, they were, they were which is known as paradise as well. And when Jesus died on the cross, he told the thief, today I'll be with you in paradise. That wasn't heaven. That was Abraham's bosom. And no, so, it, it was and so they, when, when, when they both deceased on the cross, they went to Abraham's bosom. And then that's when Christ went down and preached the gospel to the Old Testament saints. What way? You're, I, I you're trying to, to I, impose today's... Um, you know, the way, that, the way the means and operations of the gospel today, as well as the ministries of the Holy Spirit, you're trying to impose that throughout the history of earth, and you cannot do that. You have to be able to rightly divide God's word. Oh, that's I, why, I, that's well. why it says he took he took captivity of the captive. It's not they, – they weren't already in heaven. They were but unregenerate. Maybe an exegesis of that passage, please. Can you do an exegesis of that passage? Just not quote the verse. Do an exegesis, please. What is What is Peter talking about, please? All right, we're when getting Jesus... off course here. Um, no, quiet and no my bad, son, that's so. not of course. We're, we're talking about Calvinism. May we, may we continue? All right, and, and now you're, you're starting to get into the 
captivity captive from Abraham's bosom and all the rest of it here. I'm, I'm, we're not, well, we're not going to go down this road. The one who brought that up. Think of other people. I, I... Okay, so I'm sorry. I, I went ahead and muted you for a second. Let's let's get a discussion going here because I'm getting all worked up here. Wait, can I ask a question? That wasn't the goal. I want to talk. I want to have a conversation and talk through it, not debate and argue. Wait, wait. That, that's that's what I came here for. <laughs> wait, let me ask a question real quick. What's up? Um, so how is David a man after God's own heart, unregenerate? Because scripture does not indicate otherwise. Well, wait, do, do you view, know what? On our view, he can still be after God's own heart and not be regenerated because he has the decision to put his faith in God or not. That's when semi Pelagianism. Man. Holy Spirit has if you to reject it, total depravity. Of course, you believe someone unregenerate can be after God's heart. Like it's not that hard to comprehend. Don't like that's, that's semi Pelagianism. Do you not believe in a regeneration? Oh <laughs> you can't yeah, just. They call cannot names. know. <laughs> All right, hold on. See, I feel like we can't save ourselves, but the Holy Spirit is what does the saving. But like at the end of the day, we have the choice to accept the gospel and be saved or not. That's like not the Holy Spirit's work. Once we accept it, the Holy Spirit saves and seals us. That actually reminds me of Romans 116. It says, for the for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it has the power into salvation for all who believe. Oh. It's not the Holy Spirit enabling you to accept the gospel. It's just the gospel itself has the power to save you if you'll believe it. It and doesn't again, exactly. That earlier, and then that's when the John Holy Spirit does the word. You see, how you, see how you have to read in your doctrine you. to believe that? We're, we're not reading in our doctrine, lad. It, it doesn't say the that. The power though. of God unto, unto so, the gospel is Wait, why do you God. Me, why, why do you keep muting me, lad? You keep interrupting why? people, Abraham. Let's let somebody else talk, okay? I don't, want to, I don't want to kick you off. You can sit and listen for a while, but thank you. Why are you afraid of confrontation, Reed? Go ahead. As I said earlier, the root of this issue is total depravity, because that that that's where this entire this where this entire thing folds. So, is man in his flesh able to produce saving faith by the scriptures? Can we confirm or deny that? Abraham did it. Are you asking me or? Yeah, because. Yeah, because um, I'm I'm person I'm I'm a Calvinist, but I want I just want to know I want to hear both sides. Well, Can a man who is unregenerate produce faith saving faith by the scriptures? And I I, I want to go I want to go to the Bible. So let's let's Wait, talk about my some my, my Brady. You obvious, to, uh, and I don't want to get into these kind of generalized questions or anything. But the obvious answer is is that every single person that was ever saved in Scripture had saving faith prior to regeneration. I mean, that's, that's as clear as crystal. I mean, when you look at first, like for, prior example, to for example, let's, if you look at like, you know, this is like a good straightforward. I mean, a, a third grader can understand Ephesians one when you're dealing with order of salvation and, and so forth. And it breaks down further, obviously in Romans 10, um, but when it where, says, where are you at, Wade? Verse 12, Ephesians 1 12. Okay. So it says that we should be to the praise of his glory, which first trusted in Christ. That's saving faith, putting their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, obviously according to the gospel, in whom ye also trusted after, not before, after. He heard the word of truth, which seems to line up pretty well with Romans 10, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 there. After he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, before you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. No. After, also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance into the redemption of the purchased possession into the praise of his glory. You, you have to do serious linguistic gymnastics to get around the way that scripture does speak about orders of salvation, where there are no verses say, 
that regeneration precedes faith, but here you have it clearly laid out that after they believe they were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And then when you go back, taking that same context, the same saving power to Romans 10, to the passage that, you know, a lot of people stop at verses, you know, 9 through 13, that thou shalt confess to the mouth, Lord Jesus, and so forth. But when you get down to verse 13, and it says, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him? So now we're getting into where did all this come from? Did they, did they get regenerated by the Holy Spirit? Were they given some special illumination, saving magical faith that came only from the Holy Spirit as a gift? No, it says, um, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed, not believed yet, and how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? So before you can believe, you got to hear. Before you can be saved, you got to believe, going from verse 13. And how shall they hear without a preacher? Somebody's got to share the gospel with them. But it's not just the preacher. There's nothing magical about a preacher. It's a tool in the hand of God that we're called to be to go out and spread the gospel. But how shall they preach except they be sent? So they're not just random people running around. They were actually sent from an apostolic type meaning of sent forth messengers from God to be able to be sent out. You know, when God calls preachers and sends them out to preach the gospel, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things, but they have not all, what does it say, obeyed the gospel. It's a choice to obey the gospel or to not obey the gospel, but they've not all obeyed the God. All the people that heard the gospel, not all of them obeyed. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report, and then where does it all start? The very next verse. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It all begins with the word of God. That's, you know, people that when you see somebody downplaying the authority of scripture and placing, you know, the, the, the regenerative work of the Holy Spirit above scripture itself, God said he's magnified his word above his name in Psalms. The power of the gospel rooted into the word of God is what saves people when they hear the gospel and believe on it by faith. And faith is distinct from works throughout scripture, meaning that it is not a work and it's not of us. And that gets back to what I was saying earlier when you start talking about synergism and monergism and are you saying that, that we contribute to our salvation? No, we don't contribute anything to our salvation, but we meet the prerequisite for God to do 100% of the saving, which begins with regeneration, justification, sanctification, glorification, and all that that entails and everything. That's salvation. Our faith doesn't save us. Regeneration and justification and sanctification that's what saves us that's all a work of god but we're saved by grace through faith and so when a person that's god's method if if people were just going to die and go to heaven or hell regardless of what we did or even on a non-calvinistic point people say well what about the people in africa that never heard well, if they were excused from hearing the gospel, then Jesus certainly would not have given the Great Commission. He'd say, shut up, go lock yourselves up in your house, those of you that are saved. Don't tell the gospel to even your neighbor. Then they'll all go to heaven. No, the responsibility is given to us as the church to go out and preach the gospel to the whole world, to every creature, so that we can go out and give these same people that same opportunity that when they hear the word of God, that's what produces the faith. That's why when I talk to people about witnessing and sharing the gospel, I'm like, don't give all these crazy red comfort stories and analogies and all that other stuff. 
give them wait you gonna let them talk give them the word of god okay that's that's where the power is romans 1 16 like you just mentioned a minute ago that the power of, that the gospel of christ is the power of god unto salvation and that gospel is very clearly laid out in romans 15 i mean uh first corinthians 15 one through four the 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 um the definition versus what the components of the gospel actually are and when you when you make that and here's what i want you guys to get okay this side salvation okay this is all god from regeneration justification sanctification glory all of that 100 man man can't do any of these things prior to salvation you've got god initiating salvation through creation through revealing his word through getting his word to him giving him an eardrum to be able to hear his word or eyes and a brain to read and see yeah then right in the middle is that moment when a lost sinner hears the gospel preached and understands and obeys the gospel and believes on Christ by faith, not by anything that they do, that meets God's requirement that there are, I give you 30 verses throughout scripture that talk about faith unto salvation. That meets God's prerequisite to save a lost sinner then salvation takes place and then god does all of the saving 100 percent. man doesn't cooperate man doesn't is there's no synergism there's no man doing 10 percent or 50 percent man does zero percent of the saving but it's not our faith that saves it's god who saves through the regeneration justification and all the rest of it or whatever can I add some clarity to that too? It's like, it's like any story in the Old Testament, God tells Israel, if you will turn to me, I will bless you. He leaves it up to them to turn to him. Many times they didn't, and they were obviously cursed for it. Many times they did, and they were blessed. Can you say that them turn, or not that you'd say this, but you wouldn't say that them turning to God was them getting 10% of the blessing, or them contributing 10% of the blessing. You'd say, God did all the blessing. All he said was to turn to him. Yeah, exactly. And here, here's a good example. Go study it later. I don't have time to do it. I think it's in First Samuel. Was it Naaman that got healed when he walked into the river? Um, go read that passage when you get a chance. And it's a great analogy from the Old Testament that shows how that God did all of the healing all Naaman did was obey God and walk into the river. He didn't save himself by walking in the river. He obeyed God so that God could heal him. It's the same. Wait, so they're asking though, if they want to respond. And I think you asked a great question back in uh, Ephesians, which you were talking about how uh, the regeneration comes after the faith. And you kind of like uh, went on a tangent after that, but I thought that was a great question. If you want to ask that and then let them answer, because I'm interested in you. Okay, may I speak now? Is it, is it possible if I can speak? Miles, were you talking about your question or somebody else's? Your question, back when you were talking about how can, you, 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 you showed in Ephesians how regeneration comes after faith. Right. And, and I think you asked a great question, like how is that possible? Because they obviously believe regeneration precedes faith. Oh, so I think I that was a great saying. question. And I'm looking for their response to that. Any takers? Well, you said that that um, faith comes first and then regeneration, correct? So, do you believe that Old Testament saints had faith? Of course, they did. In fact, okay. Hebrews why is very they, clear that why weren't they regenerate in the Hebrews Hall of Faith and Hebrews. 12 talks about the spirit didn't regenerate that, people until that they were all saved salvation's always been by faith always so regeneration is not part of salvation it is you now avoiding the question it is now so were old testament saints not saved as hebrews chapter 12 verse 23 says 
for the general assembly in the church of the firstborn were all enrolled into heaven. So there's no distinction between Old Testament saints and New Testament saints. They were enrolled into